Karen Scrivener obtained her PhD at Imperial College in 1984. She worked for Lafarge in France for six years before being appointed professor and head of the Laboratory of Construction Materials at EPFL Switzerland in 2001. In 2003, she founded the research network NanoSEM, bringing together the leading industrial companies from cement and admixture spaces with European academic institutes to do research on cementitious materials. Her research focuses on the understanding on understanding the chemistry and microstructure of cement-based materials and improving their sustainability. In 2008, she came up with the idea for LC3 cement. This material has the potential to cut CO2 emissions related to cement by more than 400 million tons a year. She was made fellow of the UK Royal Academy of Engineering in 2014. And we are very pleased to welcome Karen Scrivener to our session. Karen? Okay, thank you. I'm going to start a bit like John of uh, changing the title around. So, um, you know, John's told us what's interesting about alkali activated cements. And he used quite a few times the word sustainability. So I'd like to change it around a bit to say, do alkali activated materials have a potential to significantly reduce global CO2? Now, why is this important? Um, I think it's extremely important if you look at these uh, countdowns. So these countdowns are calculating how long we've got before at the current level of emissions, the CO2 in the atmosphere exceeds on the left the amount that is considered to lead to two degrees double global warming, and on the left, right, to 1.5 degrees. And you see, we've got very, very little time left. Now, clearly, we're not going to go to zero uh, in seven years. And when we overshoot these targets, we're going to have to go to something like carbon capture and storage, which um, I'm not going to go into today, but it's a very, very expensive option. Uh, it, there's a lot of technical, social, and political issues attached to it. So we have a real interest to do everything we can now and as fast as possible. Now, when we come to cement, we also, you know, we're here in this ACI forum, although neither uh, John nor myself are in North America at the minute. Um, but, you know, often even between Europe and North America, we take a very um, view centered on the developing world. And of course, in terms of carbon debate, these are the areas of the world that are really putting out most in terms of energy use. But when we come to uh, cement and concrete, uh, the situation is really the other way around. Less than 10, well, only about 10% of cement consumption is in the developed world, uh, something like only 2% in the USA. Uh, it's a very low user of cement per capita. And so we really need to come up with solutions that are suitable for these emerging economies. And we know what's happened in China in the past few decades. Um, and we're going to see really following in their wake, India and other developing countries. So we really need to keep materials robust and easy to use um, and also uh, cheap. So John said I was going to talk about resources. And this is probably the most important slide I have because you know, we talk a lot about fly ash and slag. And if we look at these materials here, you see the amount available is really quite small compared to the very, very large demand of cement. If we take slag, the amount of slag produced in the world today is about 8% of the demand for cement. And that's going down. It's going down because uh, producing iron and steel is producing way more CO2 than cement per ton. Uh, iron and steel produce something like uh, seven or eight times more CO2 per ton than, cement, than concrete does. And the steel producers clearly want to cut that down. So they're really working hard on recycling. It's comparatively easy to recycle steel. Uh, it has a very high economic value to recycling. 
And they're also looking at other ways of refining iron ore to produce iron other than using blast furnaces. And then when we look at this it's a small amount of slag, it's very important to see that some 90% or so of this is already used in cement. And this means the amount left over that can potentially be used in alkali activated materials is extremely small and pretty negligible in the face of this demand for cement. And we've got a fairly similar situation with fly ash. Fly ash is a very variable product, so it's kind of more difficult to get good value out of it. Um, and also the amount available is going down very rapidly. And I mean, that's a good thing because coal is by far and away the largest source of CO2 emissions. And this limitation has, is what has led to the limitation of cement substitutes today. Now I'm gonna come back a little bit to limestone and calcine clay because these are the things that can really uh, unlock this. So if we look at this uh, graph here, this shows you that uh, in the past few decades, particularly since the 1990s, um, we have been using increasingly amounts of substitution in cement. And this is by far and away the most practical and fastest way to reduce CO2. There's a very long established uh, uh, tradition. We know how to use these materials. We know they have very good track record on durability and everything like that. Um, the only real reason that the level of substitution has stagnated at such a low level for the past uh, 10 years ago, 10 years or so, is because of the limitations in these materials. So let's come back and look at these alkali activated materials. Well, if you really look into the um, few demonstrations that have been done around the world, you will see that all these formulations uh, used in practice, which can be made at ambient temperature without heat curing, contain slag or high calcium fly ash. So fine, you can have a few nice applications. You can use that unused amount of slag and some fly ash, but that's gonna have a pretty piffling impact on world CO2 it's not going to get us out of the mess we're in. And as I've just said, we um, globally produce about 8% of cement. Nearly all that is already used in blended cements and it's used in a way that everybody understands that's really quite easy to do even in developing countries and has a very good track record. If we start diverting this slag, to produce in alkali activated materials, we may be able to say this block of alkali activated material has a lower carbon footprint. But if we think globally, we're probably actually going to increase world CO2 because now we've had to produce this activator. And these activators that are used in these alkali activated materials are by no means CO2 neutral. So you can say, okay, this piece of alkali activated material may have a lower carbon footprint, but you effectively removed slag from being used in normal concrete um, where it was already doing a perfectly good job. And I'm not going to get into technical aspects, but I think anybody who's worked on these materials knows there's a lot of unsolved technical problems. Um, because of the high levels of alkalinity, superplasticizers don't work properly. We have problems of fast setting, high shrinkage, uh, really unproven durability in many situations, very little buffer to uh, carbonation, things like that. And, you know, my view is that over the past 40 or more years, we've really wasted billions and billions of dollars and worse, in my view, many young brains on this idea. And even after this 40 years of investment, we see a negligible amount in the market. So my view is that we should stop wasting money on this. We may be able to fiddle around and make these nice niche materials that John talked about, but uh, we'd be far better off spending our money on something that's going to have some real impact in the field and help, help us face this problem of climate change. Uh, I think we also have to look at what's happened commercially. 
Since I've been in the field of cement and concrete, I've seen numerous companies starting up with great guns and great promise, we're going to produce these materials. None of these are still in the market today. The uh, last one that went uh, bankrupt was this Banasem in Northern Ireland. Um, and, you know, they produced a very nice niche material that cost twice as much as normal concrete. And unsurprisingly, they failed to develop a very big market for it. So really, I'd say that alkyl-activated materials are the ultimate labcrete. They're great for getting publications out of. Um, and there's probably been way more alkyl activation materials produced in the lab than ever in the field. And I really think it's about time we focused on where we can have an impact. So uh, looking at our report, which I hope many people have read, we rather generously evaluated the impact of these potential new materials, including geopolymers. We didn't look at geopolymers or alkyl activation materials containing slag because we considered the potential of these as being so tiny because of the very small amount of unused slag. We looked at uh, alkyl activation materials based on calcined clay, which do have this almost unlimited availability. And you see this huge margin in whether you actually save any CO2 at all. But irrespective of whether you save CO2, I think what's much more interesting is to compare these new materials with two ideas that we are tried and proven and we know have absolutely massive potential to reduce CO2. So this is calcine clay and limestone and then going to the concrete uh, level to reduce the amount of cement used in concrete. So going back to this graph here, I said, you know, this uh, level of substitution has stagnated in the last 10 years. Now, I think there's quite general agreement in the field that we could go down to clinker levels of at least 60% and probably even lower. But if we take this level that everybody's okay on of 60%, we see we can fill that huge extra demand for supplementary cementitious materials very easily by this combination of calcine clay and limestone because the clays we need are very, very abundant in the world and the most suitable materials are actually most available in those countries where the demand is going to be strongest. And making a quite simple calculation, we can see this equates to 400 million tons of CO2 per year. So that's 1% of all the CO2 we produce. And, you know, some people say to me, well, that's not very big. Well, I just say to them, if, if we get 100 ideas like that, we've solved the problem. So I think it is a very big contribution. It's about 10 times the emissions of the entire Swiss of Switzerland. Um, and I think this is a real contribution we can make to the field. Uh, I don't think we should stop there because I think there's a lot more we can do. So uh, we really need to think of this chain. We need to make sure that we produce clinker in the most efficient way. This is largely already done because it's a, a question of cost. Then we need to reduce the clinker in the cement as far as possible. And we can do this very effectively with SCMs, particularly with calcine clays. We even have formulations now down to 35% clinker, which give very, very good performance. But we shouldn't stop there because we should look at the efficiency of the cement in the concrete. We can make very big savings there. And this can be as simple as having good aggregate grading. This can be as simple as using the admixtures which are available on the market and as simple as using something like fillers in say self-compacting concrete rather than extra uh, clinker. And then again, we shouldn't stop there because we should also look at what we can do to reduce concrete in the buildings. And again, we can see sometimes factors of two or two to four between the most efficient use of concrete in buildings and the least efficient. And then we should also think whether we really need to demolish buildings or whether we can reuse them. And if we do demolish them, then what we can do to recycle these materials. And from a technical point of view, concrete can be recycled perfectly well. 
So I think all these steps are really important. And if we really put our minds to it, we can reduce the carbon footprint of uh, cement and concrete by something like 70 or 80%. Now that's not going to zero, and it means we're still going to have some uh, CO2, which needs to be captured in some ways, either in some other process, which is carbon negative, or by biological means, by planting trees, or by carbon capture and storage. But as I said, these are very expensive, and we can save ourselves a lot of money down the line by doing the easy things first. So that's what I have to say. I think the situation is extremely urgent. We have to wake up and we have to say we've got limited resources. We should dedicate these resources uh, to um, where we can have the biggest impact the fastest. And, you know, you, John can talk about these nice uh, toolkits and niche applications, but, uh, and he keeps using the word sustainable. I think that's the one thing I think they're not. They're certainly not going to contribute to this overarching problem of CO2 emissions. So thank you and hope you may have some questions. Thank you very much for that presentation.